So that brings us to our main event tonight, which is Bill Powers. And I'm going to let him share his screen here in a moment. And he's going to talk to us all about bi-directional EVs, solar, and home batteries. So Bill, thanks for joining us. And um, I will stop my screen share. Thank you, Elaine. Well, this is a recruiting presentation for me. I want to recruit some allies who are willing to go off grid with their EVs and chargers and solar power. And I am a consulting engineer by day, energy engineer, and I'm also on the board of a nonprofit called Protect Our Communities Foundation, which does a lot of uh, work before the California Public Utilities Commission fighting for rooftop solar and batteries and against um, conventional thinking at the utilities. And we're in a situation now where, and many of you are, know this at least as well as me, we're, we now have the tools where we can as individuals with one-off systems deploy solar batteries and EVs to provide electricity to our homes at less cost and greater reliability than the utility. And I think that uh, is the future. So. To, to start off, um, we are at that point where the combination of residential solar and batteries can produce power at substantially less cost than the electric utility. Now that EVs have shifted up from the 100 mile range to 300 mile range as a fairly standard range, it opens up the possibility and not the, po the possibility, but the reality that those EVs can now serve as, as, uh, as backup systems, hands off, uh, no must, no fuss backup systems for an off grid home. And with the, the real missing link until now has been the bi directional e EV charger that will allow you to take some of that EV capacity and use it to, to back up the home. And I'm guessing that many people on this uh, at the meeting already have solar, but it is very popular in California. We're passing through 11,000 megawatts of residential or combined residential and commercial solar, rooftop solar. And we also have been taking off recently on home battery systems. This graphic is a little bit uh, not that easy to read, but we now have thousands of home battery systems in San Diego. I live basically near downtown and the neighbors on either side of me both have home batteries as do I. So it's becoming much more common. And I'm sure with this group, I mean, what I'm hoping is among this group of listeners, there are numerous people that have robust solar systems, robust home battery systems and an EV with good range. If you don't have that, you're gonna to have to drop off the call because that's who I'm talking to. And so this is uh, just rate of deployment of EVs. I'm sure many of you have seen graphics like this where we're just about at 1 million EVs in California and over 2 million nationwide. But what that means is we've got over a million uh, individual rooftop solar arrays in California. We've now got approximately a million EVs. We've got tens of thousands of home batteries. And so even in San Diego, we've got 200,000 uh, individual rooftop systems that we just have a lot of candidates to take the next step. Unfortunately, a mixed bag. At the state level, things are a little incoherent right now on rooftop solar and support for it. We've got legislation that, that um, mandates support for rooftop, rapidly expanding rooftop. And yet the, the pressure is really on, on now because the rooftop has become so ubiquitous and uh, the capacity of it is great enough now that it is actually threatening, threatening the investor and utilities um, existential existence. And I'm working as an expert in the California Public Utilities Commission net metering, solar net metering proceeding that's underway right now. And uh, the, the utilities have pulled out the big guns to attempt to uh, throttle rooftop solar. At the same time, the state is 
is incentivizing and, and promoting heavily electric vehicles in home batteries. So there's a little bit of incoherence at the moment, which is one of the reasons I'm giving this presentation about uh, another way of getting the job done. Uh, the, the point here is the fourth bullet. Um, I did a study last year on solar potential of the city of San Diego, commercial rooftops, residential rooftops, parking lots, and we've got far more potential um, than we need to cover our loads, including EV loads, if when that transition really accelerates. And just a bit of side information. At the same time, we have rapidly increasing electric rates. The top bullet, 2013-2020, the uh, last few words of that bullet, 48% rise in electric rates in San Diego gas and electric territory in seven years. Next bullet, 2021-2030, SDG&E is, is projected to increase its rates another basically 50%, which is a, a really a spectacular rate of increase in electricity rates. And if anybody wants to get together for a beer at some point and talk about why these rates are going up at, at this um, angle, uh, happy to do that, but frankly, most of it's boondoggles, but it is definitely adding to rates. 2021, sdg &E average retail rates about 30 cents a kilowatt hour, expected to reach about 45 cents a kilowatt hour in 2030. And so this is really what we're comparing alternative ways of generating electricity to. Is just a point of comparison, National Renewable Energy Lab, second bullet, they call it a benchmark. They do a benchmark uh, calculation of what it costs for commercial residential utility scale solar. And they identified last year that the benchmark uh, installed cost of residential is about seven cents a kilowatt hour. Again, I just mentioned that the, the Residential retail rate of SDG at about 30 cents a kilowatt hour and rising fast. This study that I did last year, I, I looked at you know, what is the current kind of best in class pricing for solar and battery systems, both residential and commercial, specifically for a build out here in San Diego. And the, the solar and battery system I looked at was a six kilowatt DC solar system rooftop, one Tesla Powerwall uh, home battery. And that system costed out, it makes a big difference whether you finance it or whether you purchase it with cash. If you purchase it with cash, that's about seven, to seven cents a kilowatt hour, 100% financed about 12 cents. But again, compared to, to 30 cents a kilowatt hour for grid power, a good deal. So let's look at a case study here of an off-grid system and um, what the next one might look like. This is my house <clears throat> and I had the somewhat ahead of its time idea in 2015 that I could pull together a one-off system off-grid with a leaf EV that got about 100, had about 100 miles of range if you were driving downhill the whole time. I would say more like 85 to 90 on a, on a regular day. But the idea here was that even then, rates in 2015 were probably more like the low 20s, 20, 22 cents a kilowatt hour is with eight kilowatts of solar on the house and um, about 24 kilowatt hours of useful battery storage in the lower right here. At the time I couldn't get, there was no commercial vendor of home lithium battery systems. So these are sealed lead acid batteries out back. And then to the lower left is a, a backup gen set, a natural gas fired gen set. Ultimately I had to put a major uh, soundproofing around it to make the noise level acceptable for the neighbors. but a fully functional system. It, I actually had substantially, we have had substantially better reliability than stg &E over the years. The um, genset, however, so we ran, we ran off grid for about three years. The 
the, I had to put in more batteries than I anticipated. I would say we're probably um, the all in cost, monthly cost for electricity for the house, fuel for the EV. I was probably. Yeah. Okay, right there. Shut that mic off. So the, the, um, I was not able to beat the, the electricity and fuel price at that time, but I got close and it was a good test. The only reason I shut down the test two years ago was my uh, genset is a, a one cylinder Wisconsin farmer beater genset, which are good gensets, but uh, it, uh, the crankshaft on the unit broke. And at that time I decided there's no way that this will be a mass produced off-grid system because that gen set was taking too much of my time. I'm an engineer, I like working on that equipment. This is not something that grandma is going to work with, that it's gotta be hands off. And at the time, uh, bi-directional systems were just coming out. And so I decided we'll run off-grid in the evening, we'll export all this additional power during the day, and we'll transition to a bi-directional charger when we can. And so, um, what makes this a possibility to me is these, the longer range. If we've got a 300 range EV, which we have now, a Kona EV, we can always keep a heel of about 100 miles on that um, unit. So in winter, if we need to back up the house with, with the batteries on board, at most we draw down 40 or 50 miles worth of range. There's a supercharger right below us in the valley. If we ever had an issue of getting short on EV power, we could charge and be back up there in half an hour to 45 minutes. Frankly, it's perfect. And I ordered this more than a year ago and it's supposed to get here next week or in a couple of weeks. And so hopefully within a couple of months, I'll have this tied in and we can go fully off grid again uh, with the EV backing us up instead of that gen set. Now I'd like you all to memorize uh, these bullets in the next 10 seconds, then we'll have a little quiz on the numbers. And so what I did about two hours ago was I know what my costs are and I know that the battery technology I'm using is somewhat antiquated, even though it's quite solid. And that when I upgrade, I will upgrade to lithium. But what I did was I went out to Tesla's website to, to go off grid with um, solar and battery storage. Say you're a, a typical family with typical usage. Uh, this is probably a little bit more firepower than you need, but Tesla happens to have an example on their website, 10.5 kW DC solar, 25 kWh storage, two power walls, $62,000. I've, I've costed out the bi-directional charger. And by the way, I went to this, this one out of Montreal, uh, Osiaco DC Bell, because it was the only one at the time that could handle CCS charging. Whereas now there are, um, there's at least one or two others. But all in cost, $68,000 with the investment tax credit drops it to 50,000. This amount of solar power would produce about 17,500 kilowatt hours a year. Annualized cost, if you finance it at 100%, about $4,000 a year. If you did it in cash, it'd be about $2,500 a year over 20 years. Just my estimate of a reasonable O&M charge, about $500 a year. That works out to somewhere between $250 and $370 a month, depending on whether you cash or fully finance the system. And so uh, I just did this example again a couple hours ago. So I got a home, I'm using about 800 kilowatt hours a month. That's about you know, a little less than 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. EV number one, EV number two, each using about 300 kilowatt hours a month. You know, that's equivalent to about 15,000 miles a year per EV. Total monthly usage, about 1,400 kilowatt hours. Monthly cost, which is basically amortized cost of the hardware plus some, the O&M cost, 250 to $370 a month. My neighbor uh, buying grid power, $30 kilowatt hour. Same usage, that's 240 a month. Got two autos, they're both gasoline powered. They both get 25 miles to the gallon. I assume four gallons, $4 a gallon, just under $200 a month each for gas. Monthly cost to them, 
uh, over $600 a month. I much prefer to do these types of calculations in monthly costs because we're talking about electricity and fuel. And I'm not sure of any other way to do it that, that makes much sense. But bottom line, just taking what I think is a reasonable example, given those are Tesla numbers from two hours ago, um, the cost of doing this uh, all electric off-grid is about half the cost of a conventional alternative. I mentioned another competitor, Wallbox. They didn't offer uh, bi-directional on uh, CCS until now. It looks like they're coming out in 2022, but they brought up a point that I need to check out, just a, a flag to avoid me getting anyone into trouble is uh, this article mentioned the potential to void the warranty of the EV if you put a bi-directional charger uh, capability on it. I don't know if that is true or not. I'll check it out with Kona uh, before I uh, actually order that bi-directional charger, but just that was brought up and I haven't uh, um, corroborated whether that is an issue or not. And I must say, and I thank Mark Hughes for, for mentioning this, this to me about the Ford F-150 and the fact that they're offering a, a bi-directional charge capability. I'm not sure it's standard, but you can get it with the vehicle. To me, that may be the great leap forward with this vehicle that they're offering a bi-directional charger as a quasi-standard uh, part of the package, given how much difficulty uh, I've encountered in, in getting one as a standalone uh, device. I hope this becomes standard for all of the EVs because to me, it, it is such a, an incredibly useful capability. And that in this case, this is just a little bit of information I pulled off that Ford F-150 Lightning website where they are, uh, you know, they're saying they have 90 kilowatt hours available uh, to back up the house, uh, which I think is correct. But the, the fact that they're doing this to me is, is the most notable part of this EV truck. Now, getting back into my recruiter mode is over the years, I've done a lot of work on the, the East County rural areas that have been the starting point for a number of fires and the focal point of billions of dollars in spending to harden the grid. And for 10 years, the nonprofit I mentioned I'm a part of has been advocating that the money would be much better spent if you get the relatively low number of customers out there, uh, robust solar and uh, battery backup systems to allow that power to be shut off as needed without inconveniencing them. And as part of that uh, exercise, another proceeding at the California Public Utilities Commission there are about 20 customers per mile out there. SDG is spending over three million a mile to underground distribution lines, $150,000 a customer. And as you saw by my earlier calculation here with Tesla, we're looking at a cost of, to, to do that, what I would call almost gold-plated system, about $50,000 net uh, investment. So in conclusion, um, this is the future. Uh, Bidirectional EV charger, an EV with plenty of capacity, that charger is communicating with the, the home inverter and storage. And um, frankly, it should be hands off for at least 10 years. In the O&M budget that I included here, I include you know, a couple hundred dollars for panel cleaning during the year few hundred dollars for PM, just general PM to have the system checked out. But um, as you can see, just taking off the web numbers from Tesla and current uh, electricity costs, not what it's gonna be in five years or 10 years, the, the value of the, the EV combo off-grid to EV package is tremendous. And, and I am serious If anyone is interested in potentially uh, doing what I did, but at a, at a real time current, uh, with, with current technology, uh, let me know. Because I think what we really need in San Diego, given the out of control, out of, out of control spending of the utility is 
uh, some demonstration projects where individual <laughs> citizens are showing that you can do it a better, cleaner, and more reliably on your own. And thank you. Be happy to answer any questions. All right, anybody have any questions? You can just go ahead and unmute. I have a comment if I can make it. It's not a question, but <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, if I stumble a little bit, it's because I'm recovering from breakthrough COVID and uh, mm. I'd like to tell everybody, don't get it. Get your vaccine and don't get the breakthrough COVID. It's not pleasant. Um, I'm a semi-retired patent lawyer, and I've been interested in solar for many years. And it took me three years to buy a system. And unfortunately, I can't give you the name of the system at the moment, but mine came from Germany and it's water-cooled panels in that apparently the panels work better if they're cool and mine takes the now heated water and heats my swimming pool to like 90 degrees for six months out of the year. Now it is a little bit more expensive, but for one system, I literally have a heated pool. I have excess power. Uh, I have a backup battery. Mine is an LG. I'm not sure I know the difference between Tesla and LG but I'm extremely happy with the system. And you, you can actually wrap your pool heating in with your solar and it doesn't cost you anything. Um, one other comment I'd like to make is since I'm an older gentleman, I'm not really good at things like the touch screen when I'm driving. So after having a Tesla and having a uh, Leaf, I went out and I bought the uh, the Nero, the Hyundai, I'm sorry, the Hyundai Kona. And I've had it for about four months now. And it's actually producing about 310 miles in range, which is substantially more than advertised. And it has all the bells and whistles for somebody who doesn't like pushing the buttons on a... Uh, a screen in a car as you're going. So and you're laughing because I think you, you can appreciate an older guy's fingers trying to get the right spot on the uh, I'm laughing because I have a Kona EV. <laughs> you do have a Kona. Yes. They're outstanding. So <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thanks so much. And it looks like uh, we have another question from Jose. Yeah, I wanted to check um, how much do we know about the legal requirements for being connected to the grid. I've seen some things which seem to indicate that you're required to have a generator if you're not connected to the grid, at least if you have um, fire sprinklers or you have to have a fire pump. Do you know anything about that? Well, I just got an off-grid system permitted up outside of Julian by the county and mm -hmm. it has no um, it has no permanent backup generator as a plug that one could be plugged into but it's a straight solar and battery system okay good and that permit was just pulled within the last month mm -hmm. all right thanks and then i'm um, Jean, did you have a question yeah a quick one bill wonderful presentation thank you thank you um I'm wondering about the policy, at, if you know, at the policy level, if um, scg and &E and Siempra Energy are putting any pressure on any kind of regulations that would prohibit or make it really difficult for people to go off grid. Not yet. It, it will just take enough people doing it to get that ball rolling. And who would fight that? So that, that gets down to individual freedom. So that would be a tough one for them to win. But I think that if, if it became, there would definitely be some uh, discussions about it if it became the wave that I hope it does become. 
Very excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I got and a question. This Stan? Is Stan, do you want to Hello. go back? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, greetings from New Jersey. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank I you. have solar since uh, 2011. Uh, it's a grid tight system. Um, I don't have uh, a Tesla power wall or any other energy storage. I have two electric vehicles. Um, and uh, in case of uh, emergency, I uh, would like to have the ability to hook up uh, my um, uh, solar system to the car. And no matter what I went through mental exercise, I, I just don't seem it would be working easily, except of that, what you told us today, the Montreal system, you mentioned you are going to receive it in a week or two. Uh, and you mentioned in your slide that uh, that system uh, allows you to bypass the solar inverter. Uh, my question is, if I have uh, the solar tabs, I have I have string. I don't have microinverters, okay? Mm -hmm. So I have like a high voltage DC available. Is it possible with this system uh, that I don't have the, the energy storage and uh, connect it to the vehicle? Possibly, because the... Interestingly enough, that uh, Osiaco uh, bidirectional charger is also an inverter that can take inputs from solar panels. Cool. And uh, I just happened to note that when I was putting this presentation together because I wasn't looking for that capability. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, possibly, and I think with your configuration, you may want to contact them directly and determine whether you can can you uh, give me some contact information? I never heard of this company. Yeah, if you just Google O S S I A C O, uh, the you will get the company in. Uh, they're in Montreal, and this particular O S S O S S I A C O, and, and this is called a D C Bell. Okay, DCB. something. Yeah, it's coming up. D C Bell EV charger, solo inverter, and okay. Yep. Let me look it up. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yep. Great. Thanks. And then Simon, would you like to go next? Thank you, Elaine. First of all, a great presentation. Really enjoyed it. A lot of useful information. This is something I've thought about. I do know that several years ago, I looked at the warranty on Tesla's batteries, and they did indicate, at least at that time, that you would void your warranty if you engaged in bidirectional charging. But here's the question I have, and, and I'm not an engineer, so there may be some ignorance involved here, but my understanding is lithium ion batteries have a certain life cycle to have so many charges and discharges before the battery starts to lose ever increasing amounts of range. What impact would using an EV to back up your house have on the long-term longevity of an EV battery, if you know? Uh, I, can, I can conjecture. And based on my own experience, uh, having an off-grid solar and battery system is that probably the, the maximum amount of, of time that that genset operated in even a wet year was about 40 hours during a, a winter producing maybe 150 kilowatt hours. There was one winter where it was dry we didn't use it at all. We just ran the entire year on the solar and battery system and never tapped into the, the backup system. And so, the, frankly, I would think that the number of times, if you, have a, if you have a conservatively designed solar system for your loads and you have a conservatively designed home battery system that is ample for your needs, you shouldn't be using that bi-directional charger much at all. I mean, maybe a handful of times a year. And so I think that uh, the impact it would have on the longevity of the Tesla battery or the Kona battery, frankly, would be nil. But it, this could be kind of a CYA action by the manufacturers if they're worried that someone might be cycling those batteries every night. Um, you know, there's probably a scenario where they could actually shorten the life of the battery, but in the, in the scheme that I'm talking about, they should be used a handful of times a year. Um, I can actually say something about that. There have been studies with that. 
uh, by some groups that are interested in vehicle to grid. And it's actually the running the battery at the very low levels that shortens the life. And what these studies have shown is that if the, um, the battery is used in a vehicle to grid mode and it's not used to its full extent, just used a small amount near the mid range of the charge, it really has no impact at all on the life of the battery. Yeah, yeah Jose, if there's one or two of those studies that you would recommend, please let me know. Um, like yeah, I have, I'll send them to you. Okay. Excellent, thank you. All right, next we'll go to Tom. Oops, my bad. I was trying to unmute you. So try it again. There we go. All right, yeah, thanks Elaine. And uh, thank you, Bill. I've been um, following you for a while. Uh, your uh, roadmap uh, that you uh, have advocated for San Diego. So I commend you. you. Uh, yeah. You. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about um, you asked if anybody was doing this or if anybody was planning to do what you have done. And uh, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of cowboys out there that have been experimenting with this stuff for a long time. And there's a lot of legitimate engineers that have had to do uh, this sort of thing. Uh, I'm a retired marine engineer, so I've been making power and distributing it uh, on ships uh, all my life. And as I got into more and more modern vessels, we had more and more automation with our energy management into where we could have uh, generators come online automatically as load increased. And, uh, um, and especially uh, in the morning, I, I, I did, uh, after I retired off tugs, I started working on large yachts and we, you know, we had to make, extra water, hot water in the mornings when people were getting up and showering. So, so energy management is a huge part of what we're talking about here today. Um, and uh, I, I just uh, feel like uh, we're at the, at the eve of, of such interesting um, possibilities of not just making our own power for our homes, but um, uh, uh, driving, driving for free. I like to call it for free. Of course, we know we have these huge outlays, these huge costs to, to, to be able to get started doing this stuff, but uh, it derives such great satisfaction from actually keeping the lights on and, and, and taking care of the transportation needs uh, all, from, all from the sun. So uh, yeah, I'm in, man. You can count me in as one of your... Uh, uh, one of your uh, advocates. Great. We'll be in contact, Tom. Thank you. And uh, Ray? Yeah. Uh, my, my, my question is, if you've got a configuration where, say, you've got a home that has uh, solar panels and has a couple of Tesla power walls, and then uh, you also have an a, uh, electric vehicle, and primarily you would cycle through using the power walls. And the, but when you run those out, at that point, you start drawing power from the electric vehicle. How far, how much do you draw out of the electric vehicle? Do, do you draw it down to 20% of, of its capacity or, or how do you decide that? That's a good question. Just I'm just basing my estimate off my own experience where the, the most over three years that we ever required from the backup system was about maybe 10 or 12 kilowatt hours, which translates into 40 or 50 miles of range. And right. so the, the, we don't have the bi-directional charger yet, so I haven't been able to play around with this yet, but I, I have a kind of a, uh, in, in briefing my family, it's that, you know, we, there's been no COVID has thrown us a little bit, a little bit of a curveball because we don't really have a consistent driving pattern uh, yet again. But that we've had this EV for about two and a half years, and we we rarely pull it down below about 150 
miles of range. And we would only need, in, in my estimation, the maximum of about 50 miles to back up the house. And so the rule of thumb is just let's keep in the wintertime under cloudy conditions. And you have to be a little aware of what's happening around you. If you're going into days and days of cloudy conditions, just be aware of it so that you're not caught completely by surprise. But that would, under those conditions in the winter, let's just keep a, at least 100 or 150 miles on the vehicle. So there's no issues, but having said that, I mean, there is a supercharger less than five minutes from us so that, you know, if we got in a situation where things look like they might remotely be tight, we could be down and back in a half an hour with, you know, 150 miles worth of range. So things are just, there's enough redundancy. And that's one point that I didn't make in my presentation that I should have is for me, the, a key is redundancy two power walls, um, you know, two of everything, so that if something fails, you still have a partly operational system and you can, in a, in, in a non-emergency environment, take care of whatever um, caused part of that system to go down. But that, that redundancy is important. It, it's not hard to get, you just have to be aware that you need it. All right, great. We've got about five or six more questions here. So um, thanks for that question, Ray. And Bob Unger, would you like to go next? Sure. Basically, I think I want to ask for a clarification. If I understand correctly, you're advocating to build a system that meets your needs, all with a stationary battery pack, have uh, EV to home ability to back that up in case that static storage is insufficient and possibly also adding a backup generator in case you wanna use that instead of depleting your car's battery so that you will not be using any grid storage. Oh, and let me be clear. Uh, this system would not include a backup gen set. Backup gen set is displaced by the bi-directional charger in the EV. Okay, and the other question, the actual question I have, how often do you recommend cleaning panels? I know after some time of being totally negligent, I did mine and I think I saw a 20% increase overnight. I think we just had the same experience. I, I got uh, lazy about having mine cleaned. I used to clean them myself, but I had too many experiences right on the edge of the roof and decided that I would uh, farm that out. And we just cleaned our panels after probably nine months or so. and we saw a much bigger jump than I had thought. I thought we were getting pretty good production. And then, and we were getting pretty good production, but when the panels were cleaned, I would say 20% is probably about right. Word to the wise. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Thanks. All right, Russell. Hey, uh, yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. I, I love to see that off-grid setup you had and, and seeing some of the cost modeling you've done. Um, I, I've been discharging my car for a few years and uh, really passionate about the subject. So great to see this topic. Um, I did, I kind of, I had a setup at, at my place where I uh, put a transfer switch to be able to discharge my car. So I wanted to say, you know, if you have a, definitely hand is raised as uh, you find others who are interested. And I thought oh, I would put in, in the chat um, a video that I did the other week of uh, kind of how I set that up. So if anyone wants to, check that out. I um, thought it'd be great to get some feedback from folks. Yeah, I'd love to take a look at that, Russell. Can you put the link in the chat, please? Yeah, we will do. Excellent. Thanks. And then uh, Dave Crow. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. OK. Uh, Couple comments and a question. Uh, definitely, what Bill is saying about uh, uh, in this situation, if uh, solar panels are a, a key part of this, uh, you do have to be a little bit of a weatherman, uh, especially in the winter time, so you can anticipate uh, uh, some cloudy days because that will uh, uh, drain your system if the sun's not shining. Uh, and mainly, my question. Out back to Bill and maybe others, if uh, somebody has insights, uh, there was some brief mention on uh, in chat as to what cars out there already have a bi-directional capability. 
Uh, I mean, Ford made a great leap in, in doing this and being outward about it, but uh, I know that I've read a little bit about uh, at least a couple of the manufacturers already having cars on the road that are at least designed to be bi-directional, but uh, definitely not being uh, advertised as such. Uh, does anybody else uh, know about other cars that already have that capability? I think Porsche might, might be one of them, or maybe VW. VW Mark, do you know says anything they're on going that? to. VW, going to. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. What other vehicles have that capability? Nissan. Nissan? Yeah. Well, yeah, Nissan we, has been playing with that for a long time, uh, but I don't, I didn't know that they were actually putting that in their production cars. Pretty much everybody except Tesla is saying that their future models are going to be bi-directional. Okay. All right, thanks. And uh, Robert. Uh, hi, thanks, Bill, for the presentation. Um, I've heard test that capability, but Elon doesn't want to turn it on, so he doesn't want to cut into the power wall sales, but that's a whole separate story. Um, he can, apparently can turn it on in a moment. Um, my question is, Bill, um, do you know anything about the SGIP program? Um, I have your exact system of 10 wires or two power walls, but I got the two power walls for $250 installed through the SGIP program. And, and I'm, I just looked just now, and now they're at level six, which is, it, it's complicated, but they're, they're in the systems about out of rebates. Do you know anything about that and how maybe all this new money might reinstitute re that program? Well, the SGIP program is really, uh, refocused on equity and resiliency. Most of the budget is now going into high fire threat areas for low to moderate income customers. And so uh, I definitely agree with their focus on high fire threat districts. And at this point, the way it's set up is they're paying a dollar a watt for an incentive for power walls and similar home batteries if you meet those, those requirements. And if you do meet those requirements, they're basically buying the battery, not dissimilar to when you're saying you got the batteries for $250, that, that if you are equity resiliency qualified and the money is there, which it still is because there's over half a billion dollars in the, in the pot, that's the target recipient. Okay, so they changed the focus. I don't think San Diego Gas and Electric has any money though left. I just looked and they're out of money. We're the only region, uh, I'm San Diego, I mean, Southwest does, PG&E does, but we're out. So, anyway. yeah, for, for, if you don't, there is some uh, relatively small amounts of money for other types of customers who don't meet that equity resiliency uh, category, but the, the overwhelming bulk of the money is for that demographic. Okay, thank you. And by the way, just as a footnote, in my system without bi-directional, I have, I had one electric car and made it 13 months without using the grid with just a 10 kilowatt system and two Tesla power wells. I went, I bought it. I now have three electric vehicles. So I do do bi-direction. I do use my battery more. I do have to depend on the grid, but I still have a negative true up for six years now. I've never paid a penny. Wow, that's very impressive. Excellent. All right, John, and then we'll take, I think we've got two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. All right. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Bill, as well for your presentation. We were talking earlier about the uh, utilities growing increasingly worried about maintaining their profits and uh, with a heavy hand pushing uh, net metering 3.0 making solar less and less attractive for people thinking about solar as well as people who already have it, as well as uh, we also talked about maybe uh, utilities might uh, take steps to uh, uh, make it difficult to uh, do an off-grid system like we were learning about tonight. And uh, what I'm thinking about is this, is that uh, solar in general, rooftop solar seems to be generally popular among uh, voters and renewable energy, et cetera. And I'm wondering, is there any, uh, any, have you heard anything about 
uh, maybe a California ballot proposition that would uh, basically ask the the uh, utilities to keep their hands off of uh, of this and, and preserve, protect and preserve the rights of people who own uh, solar systems to do what they wish, to go off grid if they wish. Uh, have you heard anything about that kind of proposal? Well, there has been a tremendous upswell of uh, solar integrators, people who have solar pushing back on a pretty draconian piece of legislation earlier this year, which was meant to hobble rooftop, not so much to protect the rights of people to go off grid, which hasn't really risen to a uh, high visibility level yet, but all of this utility uh, concerted effort to undercut rooftop solar, just as it seems to have uh, boomeranged on them repeatedly. It happened yep. in 2013, it boomeranged on them. And the, the bill that was meant to kill solar actually ended up resulting in a great expansion of solar. Yes. And we now have them kind of overplaying their hand at a time when the governor is about to go into a recall election. And, and so the, the pressure point now is the governor probably doesn't want to be the governor that killed solar just before the recall election uh, comes around. So it's just opportunistic pushback where the utilities, you know, the, the initial impression is uh, they've got a lock on it. And then a few months later, it boomerangs. So uh, the we'll see how this goes. I think they'll make some headway this time, but I'm not too concerned about the ability of the electorate, the people of California to rise up and say, we want this as an option and it will stay an option and a viable one. Okay. Let, let's hope for another boomerang. Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, and then uh, Greg. Hi, um, I don't really have a question. I guess I'm trying to understand the actual benefits of going off grid. In my scenario, I overproduce my solar and I have two Tesla power walls. And I know Tesla is talking about, you know, the their virtual power plant and so I can imagine if you had a Tesla vehicle, power walls and solar, you, if you're tied into the grid, you know, Tesla would ba basically buy energy from you and resell it to the gas and electric company. Uh, and presumably that rate would be more favorable to the, uh, gas and electric company than firing up a, a power plant. And I guess I I'm just wondering if you, if you have any thoughts on that. And I guess the other question I have is in my scenario where, where I overproduce, if I disconnect from the grid, um, you know, I, I, I could understand the benefit of operating independently, but I, you know, I have extra power and it's not going anywhere. These are great observations, Greg, because I have been in that exact situation. But the reason for going off grid is not, is not necessarily to make maximum use of every kilowatt hour you produce. It's to show the utility that you can do it, that that's not the only game in town. And that it, it is true that you, going to get more efficient use of your kilowatt hours if you have the ability to export. And I actually, I mean, that's what I do now. We go off grid at night and we export during the day because we have so much extra uh, power. But, and, and so in a perfect world where you were working with a, a, uh, a partner to make maximum be best use, working with the utility would be the way to go. In this case, the, so much money is being poured in the wrong direction, driving up the rates, that the point I'd like to make, and I, I think is important to make, is that the, the, utility, the utility's right to your utility, having you as a customer is a privilege. It's not a right. And you have the ability 
to end the arrangement if you choose to. And it's one thing to, to have that be a conceptual idea and it's another thing to do it. And it's not gonna take many people to do it before it will be a very, I think, um, cathartic uh, un, um, event, cathartic experience for the utility to see that people can actually do this and they can do it cheaper, better, faster. And so we either need to clean up our act or not, but we're just happen to be at the point. I think Tom, you mentioned this where we can actually do this at substantially less cost than what the utility is providing uh, power for. And um, currently there is zero power on the part of the customer, but this is power to go off grid and show that you can do it on your own if you need to. So uh, that would be the reason. Okay, well, thanks very much. Excellent, thank you. All right, well, it's almost seven o'clock, so I think we're, well, actually I told John Sroka, did you, did you have a question? We'll make yours the last question. Hey, Bill, uh, in the very beginning of your presentation, this is kind of off topic, I guess, but you said you had a smaller, smaller solar system. How many kilowatt hours do you produce a day? Oh, about max is about 50, 52. Um, what part of town do you live in? University Heights, right above Mission Valley. Because I, I only produce like 32 a day on a, on a good day, 32, 34. But I think I'm affected by the, um, what do you call it, the marine layer. We, we live right near Soledad Mountain, and that seems to be the magnet for, you know, for, for marine layer. How much capacity do you have? Um, my system is uh 5.7 okay because we're huh? we're eight we are eight so you're we're eight. Pr so you're pretty larger. larger yeah I'm only, I'm only i'm only like 17 or 18 panels i think but uh um but it sounds actually, like you're doing you're doing pretty well because i've got 32 panels and wow, you're, you're, much, you're, yeah I, I was always just wondering i never saw anybody talk about how much they produce and we've had we've read a lot on the cleaning of, of panels and uh, everybody seems to say that we get just enough rain here in San Diego to keep the panels clean. I mean, you know, it only rains once or twice a year and they say that's enough. So I, I don't know. I'm just guessing. No, I think there was a comment earlier about panel cleaning and uh, I know that it probably is a good idea to clean those panels a couple of times a year because we did lo lose a significant amount of uh, output by letting them get pretty dusty. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Well, and thank you so much, Bill. This has been really, really informative and super helpful. So appreciate yeah. your time and effort. I liked all the interaction. Thank you, Elaine. Excellent.